some people who have all supported the events and all of our volunteers. Um, and to introduce, this is Stella Hall, who's going to chair the event, and um, everybody else will introduce themselves. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline. Great to be here. And this fantastic event, Jabberwocky Market, um, which comes straight after the event that I recently um, uh, led, the Festival of Thrift. And I think what both of those do is try and smuggle great arts into a, a context that doesn't sound like an arts event. Certainly a, a Jabberwocky Market doesn't sound like an arts event, but it's got great art in it. And I think some of you will have seen that last night. Uh, with the work of uh, theatre ad infinitum and Nia Paldi, who's going to speak in a moment, the co-founder, uh, director and star in many senses. Um, on my left, uh, you have, uh, uh, we have uh, Natalie Tabatabai Khatambash, who is the founder, director and uh, sometime performer of Zende, who we are very fortunate to have based in the North East with us in Newcastle. And we're going to talk about how does social conflict affect the development of theatre? Which sounds like an O-level set question, doesn't it? But we'll make it much more interesting than that. Um, actually, I remember an O-level set question. The essence of drama is conflict. Um, and who wrote that? Aristotle. Weren't the Greeks great? So it goes right back to them that not only can theatre come out of conflict, but actually the essence of drama, of theatre itself, is conflict, which we might debate and discuss. But before we get into the discussion, and uh, I'll, I'll make sure that you all get a chance to join in, because I want to try and make this as um, flexible and as open as possible, I'm going to ask each of our honoured guests uh, during this uh, Fun Palace weekend to say a little bit about uh, their work, what, where it came from, how it started, what drives them as theatre directors, uh, and makers um, within the context of our discussion question. And then I will ask them a couple of questions, or I might even interrupt and ask for a little bit of amplification, elucidation. I won't be saying um, uh, your, your 60 seconds is up. I'm going to ask them to speak for rather longer than that so we get a good uh, hearing from them both. Um, but I'm going to ask our visitor first to speak, uh, uh, fresh from the success of Ballad of the Burning Star last night. Nir. Yeah, so my name is Nir Paldi. I'm a co-artistic director of Theatre Ad Infinitum. Um, Theatre Ad Infinitum was funded seven years ago. Um, we, me and my co-artistic director, George Mann, met in a school called uh, Ecole Internationale de Théâtre Jacques Lecoq in, in Paris, um, where we trained, where we actually met most of our collaborators and uh, most of the people we work with today. And um, I think one of the things to say about our company is that uh, the productions we make, we are making are very different from one another. So each production is very different in form and in theme to the previous ones and the ones that are coming up. Um, of course, there are threads in, in, in style and in... Um, in, actually, in terms of the kind of material we make, sometimes people get a bit of a shock when they, <laughs> they see the, the next piece. Or actually, now that we have a bit of a portfolio of work, when they see a piece we've made three years ago, they get sometimes confused uh, or surprised or shocked by the fact that it's the same company who made it. But um, for us, it's part of the narrative we want to create or part of our research in a sense or our search for what is it that we want to make because um, we enjoy the surprise in it, we enjoy surprising ourselves um, and we, f we believe that um, every theme has a specific theatrical form that would serve it best. Um, yeah, so I think actually, I don't know if speaking about ballad already, ballad of the Burning Star is but Ballad, for example, was, if, uh, I think I recognise a few faces from the stage yesterday. <laughs> Can I just interrupt yeah. then and ask, yeah. how many of you did see the performance last night? Just so we got a feel of, great, okay. Yeah, so for Ballad, for example, I don't know what your feelings about the show. It's a show that people have many different feelings about. Um, but what we were trying to achieve is something that would help be in service of 
conversation or opening up of an extremely complex theme. So we were looking for quite a while for some for a, for a style, theatrical form, that would help um, in help um, accommodate the complexities um, and the the fact that it's so slippery the subject for me at least, yeah. Um, and we wanted to create um, something that is a bit more that keeps swapping its form and changing its form as it goes along. Um, yeah, so that's a good example of how a style was kind of coming together f during a research process of the making of the piece. And um, we basically do that once we feel the passion of speaking about a certain theme. It's the second, the second step, which is finding the best theatrical form of, of how, to, how to address the, the specific theme we chose, so to speak. Talk a little bit more about the genesis of that. Yeah, so I wanted to make, ever since I worked for years, I mean, it's a very different thing making, um, making work about your nationality in the country your nationality is originated from, um, to making it abroad in exile. Um, so I think I always wanted to make work ever since I was very young about being an Israeli and about the conflict. Um, but the passion grew even stronger when I left Israel, when I went to France to study. Um, and I, while in school I was trying it in different ways and it was, you know, when you create it around people that are not Israeli. You start having to articulate things in a different way because a lot of common assumptions and co collective consciousness isn't there um, or there is a different collective consciousness just because we are human the culture is different um, a Canadian or an English person wouldn't have the same set of um, you know narratives planted in their brains in the same way um, so yeah it's ever since then when I was about 23, I assume, when I moved to Paris. I wanted to make work about it, and it just grew and grew, and I moved to Eng England, we made a few first pieces, and I think just, um, it used to be that when people would ask me, where are you from, so just saying I'm Israeli, would be a stressful and quite complicated thing to do, because it would always bring such a massive amount of, um, actually opinions and feelings with it, just saying it. Um, and in, one, in some ways I felt very, it was very tiring for me, and kind of, I just wanted to be me, not to have my nationality as some sort of um, heavy coat that you're wearing everywhere you go. Um, and then I, I, thought, I felt that I need to do something in order to I need to learn how to inhibit this nationality in a more convenient, more comfortable way, and I need to be able to be to be it, uh, in a sense, with, with everything that comes with it. So I decided to to start looking at it through theatre, um, and obviously also I wanted to create conversation about the thing itself through through my feelings. I wanted to share these complex feelings um, about my nationality, but also about the conflict and what Israel is doing to the Palestinians, and in return what the Palestinians are doing to the Israelis, it's already difficult. It already, as I'm saying this sentence, it becomes slightly uncomfortable. Is that the right way of phrasing it? La, la, la. And we see immediately the complexity of saying one word about this theme. Because for me, like anything you, you say is not completely um, the reality, because the reality for me is extremely complex. Um, but yeah, so then I started by making a, I thought I will make a one person show actually, just me being myself and telling stories about my experiences. And uh, I spent about six weeks with George in a room he was directing and I was like, it was extremely hard telling all those pe things that um, I experienced as an Israeli, like national things. And I was shocked how personal they felt. Like the assassination of a prime minister, for example, just, I'm just now saying it, let's get feel emotional. It was like shocking for me, the discovery of how emotional it made me feel. Something that is so collective, 
Um, but the, the experience, the trauma of this event, for example, uh, was so personal, so, and, and many more events like that. And I just spent about four or five weeks just sharing stories, just standing there and telling, getting all those things out, learning basically to, to open up in this way in front of someone that is no Israeli. Um, and then we put together about a 20, 25 minutes, one person piece, and we performed it to a very close uh, group of friends. And I ended it up with a, a feel, strong feeling that that's just not sufficient <laughs> in order to, 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 to do a real piece that deals with the profound um, themes of this issue. Um, so for the first time, I felt very strongly that I need to find uh, some sort of a mask some sort of distance um, between myself and the theme and the spectators, something more theatrical, so to speak. And um, I felt, and that's where I first thought about uh, being in drug. Uh, it was just an instinct to begin with. I was just felt like, because this, there was something in it that is very um, evidently theatrical, very evidently someone trying to be something that they are not. Oh, actually, again, that's going to bring us to a discussion about what does it mean a man dressed as a woman. So am I trying to be a woman or am I trying to be a man dressed as a woman? Or am I just a man dressed as a woman? But anyway, the way I took it was that um, I'm just... Uh, the, 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 the metaphor of someone trying to cover up themselves, their real identity, um, so the whole concept of the cover-up, uh, I thought um, this, or this is already the intellectual process of analyzing the, the instinct that I had about that. Um, yeah, so I, this came there, <coughs> and then I thought, actually, it would be really cool if we contextualize it within more people. So this, this diva, this drug queen, she has a troop uh, around her of these five women, and then I was very interested with um, um, men dressed as a woman controlling very violently a group of women, and so in one way the man is trying very hard to be one of them, one of these, sis of these sisterhood, part of the sisterhood, but they can never because they are genetically a man, um, and in another way using the very quick um, instinct we've got when we see a man being aggressive towards a woman to, to see in, uh, this is the strong part and this is the weaker part. Um, um, not that I'm saying that that's what it is, you know, but like it's social presumptions. Um, and I, I thought about using that and the metaphor towards Israel and Palestine started becoming more apparent to me and more interesting. And um, yeah, we started doing research and we spent about seven weeks putting the initial 50, not, the, nothing like you saw yesterday. Some bits are the same, but a well, the first draft of 50 minutes, which we performed nine times in front, in front of an audience and got, did after show talk after every one of those nine times and got nine sessions of feedback, which was extremely hard, but extremely helpful. Um, and then we, I went away for a few months and rewrote actually, which we don't do very often, but I actually sat down and rewrote and sent friends and colleagues drafts of the writing and got feedback and rewrote again and got into the rehearsal space again a um, few months later and we spent another five weeks and again performed it and then spent another week and, and yeah, that's how it came and the show is growing all the time. Um, and we find more play in each moment and new things. And it's a very special group of people. We are very close friends as well. So there is something very alive in this. Not, it's very different than other productions. There is something. Because I actually brought all these, um, all these women, they are very, very close friends of mine, that I brought from all over the world, really. So Because um, I felt so vulnerable with this um, at the beginning. And there was something that like, I felt I needed these people that would, I could feel very open with in order to support me. It was very, it's amazing, you know, sometimes as a director you have to be very strong so your actors are strong as well, but actually here it was 
sometimes I would in Edinburgh, especially because it's such a high tense, <laughs> high, high tense atmosphere with like sometimes you have 10 critics sitting in an audience and like, and how many people are going to come it's very stressful and um i would say to my cast oh god i'm so stressful and they'll be like you know eh, be strong come on you know, they'll be like um yeah so yeah thank you and i'm not going to ask anything about that until we've heard from nadley where I think there may be some themes coming out of that that you that you may well pick up on and give another perspective. But Natalie, tell us about Zende and how that began and how you catapulted yourself into the the theatre world in the UK from Iran. So um, let's begin there. Perhaps um, I was born in Iran, um, just a few years before the revolution. Um, but I'll come back to that. I'll come back to that. Um, so Zende was set up in Edinburgh. I was a jobbing director at that point, um, and I was getting a bit frustrated that although there was fantastic art and culture happening in Edinburgh and across Scotland, there was a bit of a, a gap in, in festivals or in theatre programmes or in dance venues for the kind of work that I wanted to not only make but also see. And that was really about hidden histories and work that perhaps enabled me to understand this island better from the perspective of other, other nationalities, other communities. I got very interested in this, uh, that connection point, the conversation between and across borders. But also, a bit more intimate still, this idea of a one-to-one -one accountability. Theatre as a form is one person telling another person's story in a live space, and I, I'm really committed to that. Um, so I thought, okay, the company needs a name, um, and I thought, well, if I'm going to say the company's name more often than my own, um, it should really mean something, and Zenda is a Farsi word that means alive. So we started making work, we made some partners, we developed work that in the first year we were awarded an Amnesty International commendation for a piece that we presented at the Edinburgh Festival. Um, and it was a piece that I guess in some ways the way it was described by others was that it's, is it feminist theatre that you're making? Um, oh no, her work is political. It's political theatre, that's what she's doing. Um, what else? It's new writing. It's new writing. It's Scottish new writing. That's what she is. That's what she is. Um, and very soon I realised that these labels were not necessarily about me being censored or being limited <coughs> or boundaries being put upon me, but rather an opportunity to help others to share the work with each other. And I got interested in this idea of, okay, so what is the purpose of the company? Is the purpose of the company to create work that between artists and audiences, we can find a new vocabulary to talk about conflict or social change, or to talk about things that, that make us feel and make those emotions overflow to be able to find new words to describe our modernity. Um, we started to make some experiments with our work overseas. Um, some of that work involved being in Iran um, through Visiting Arts and the British Council. There was support from the Scottish Arts Council for us to do that as well. Um, but the context in Scotland was changing. For us, we were such a small company, we were tiny, 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 we were very reliant on um, project funds, and at that point, um, how funding was happening in Scotland was changing. So we thought, okay, we either tough it out here, or we take a train journey of an hour and a half and go over a border, our closest border, and into England. And we've been in the north of England for six years now longer than we've been, we were in Scotland. So maybe are we now an English company? You decide, you decide. Um, we are a national portfolio organization. And if you're not familiar with, with that, it, it means that we are supported for three years to make a program of work. 
what it means for me is that we can have deeper, more meaningful relationships with artists, creatives, managers and collaborators. It means that we can be bold and be more daring than we could imagine to be if we were perhaps working in a, between a piece of cheese and a piece of string to make things happen. Although sometimes it can still feel like that. Um, so between 2012 and 2015, maybe this would be useful, um, we <coughs> looked at creating a theme to work within. And the title of the theme is Between the Law and Religion, Our, Our Stories. And we felt actually this theme enables us to offer up a little bit of a description about what we're interested in, but also I hope demonstrates that we're interested in the panorama of the public as well. To make our work, we have a seven stage process that goes over a year. There's a lot of R&D experimentation. We engage with um, different art forms to make our work. I think we've just been very fortunate to have met people who have inspired and influenced us. And that's something we continue to do. So I guess our, our more immediate connection with this room right now, this time is the upstairs. Um, at the last Jabberwocky market, we had the chance to scratch a piece of work called cinema. Um, and I guess that's a really good way of, of demonstrating what we are like as a company. We have some ideas, we'd like to offer something up. We reach a point where we need and crave a public response to it. One that is deep, one that is going to challenge us, and one that is going to forever prompt this, this um, that what is our purpose, and to push that. Thank you very much, Natalie. And I think both uh, artists have um, made it clear that uh, finding a place here in the UK, in England now specifically, that they have been able to tell some of those stories, some of those stories that they've they both felt needing, needed to be told. And, and I, I want to challenge you both a little, um, because we're, you know, we're, we're talking about how does social conflict affect the development of theatre, and we're not necessarily in those places of conflict. We are in places of conflict frequently, and I'll return to that. But I'd like to ask you separately, how might that work have been different, or would that work have emerged? Had you been working in Tel Aviv, how would that work... Could that work have been made if you had been working in Tehran? Mm. Um, yeah, I'm often asked, will I take the piece to, to Israel? And I always say that I feel like for this to happen, it needs to have a very strong backing or by a festival or by a venue that would want to host it and stand fully behind it. Because although perhaps in the context of Europe, this piece doesn't feel very left-wing or very extreme and more balanced or... Um, but in Israel, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's quite extreme, and people would get very angry. And I think especially because I'm using non-Israelis, and I did it on purpose, um, I think there is a very strong element of uh, doing the dirty washing outside um, and a lot of exposing that would really aggravate people and is aggravating people, and I'm very happy with that. That's why I did it. Um, and actually, the closest, like where I was very happy that it happened, um, Madi Costa did a, interviewed me for the Guardian before we went to the Batista Art Center to perform the piece. Um, and their interview, well, I said quite left wing things um, about sustain, like a, preferring even a, terrorist attacks taking place on a daily basis rather than continuation of the occupation and stuff like that. But I did say it in a broader, slightly more complex argument <coughs> and in the article it comes across extreme, like very much <laughs> as a statement. Mm -hmm. I think maybe that's the... I don't think, I'm not sure, but it's potentially the, the title of the thing. And um, it was bought, it was so, yeah, as press does. Um, and it was bought by a major Israeli um, newspaper and translated into Hebrew um, and brought a wave of hatred uh, in the comments, which was fine, but it was very interesting for me because it was, um, in a sense, resonating quite powerfully 
um, in the Israeli society, which was great, perhaps in a, in a different way. Um, yeah, in, in some ways, um, it actually, I, I told you before, Stella, that we are doing a lot of those after show discussions. Um, and um, a lot of time, and sometimes the piece raises questions of boycott. People suggest, we've just been to Bradford, and before we opened the uh, theater in the mill, and before we opened, there was a huge hoo-ha because someone tweeted uh, a call for boycott. Um, and there was a huge thing, and the, the theater of the mill, um, they, they brought security on site, and at seven o'clock, just before we opened, there was a police officer was coming in, and I was, in, somewhere in my brain, I was thinking, well, this seems over the top, because we had these calls for boycott before, and then nothing happens, and if people want to boycott, they can boycott. Nobody said, we're going to put a bomb in the theater, but somehow this, like it somehow drew me back to my like Israeli paranoia, um, and it was very very nerve wracking. But then obviously it was an audience of fifty middle class white people. That someone, the whole fifty of them in Bradford, they came to the theater that evening. There were a few more than that. <laughs> um, and it was a very standard procedure performance. Um, but for ex this was a very powerful example for me because I felt, and it taps into a much wider discussion of the role of theater. Um, also in, in Birmingham, but that's also about like, I don't know how many people in the room are in theater and are, pa are interested in discussion of what arts venue should be doing. Because as a theater maker, it's so frustrating when you drag about like, eight people that you hire, you flew from Canada and you get to Birmingham that has a, into the mark and you have a massive, you know, Jewish community on one side and even massive year uh, Muslim community and you have 50 people in a, in a, in a studio of, of uh, 300 potentially and where are they? I'm getting my fee, that's fine, but where, what are we doing with, uh, why are we here? Um, how are we bringing those people? What can we do so more people are engaged, especially in things that are trying not to just entertain, but actually... Let's ask, let's, let's, yeah. let's ask those questions. Before we, before we go into yeah. that wider one, I'm going to ask Nazli to, uh, to answer the question uh, from earlier. Look, I, I, said, I said before we started, perhaps a measure of our success in broadening the audience is that some of those Games Workshop guys are drawn in to this discussion about theatre. So powerful and moving is our discussion that they cease to want to play a games workshop and give some time to us today. We can but dream, that's my theatrical utopia. Um, but what the question I asked earlier um, uh, of both was, you know, how would you be making work now in a place uh, like Tehran, uh, rather than where you've chosen to work, where there is a, a measure of free speech? And as we've just heard, really not, not, not total <laughs> yeah. free speech, because you know, we, there have been boycotts of Israeli companies in Edinburgh, mm -hmm. there's been boycotts of Exhibit B uh, um, from South Africa, uh, strong issues raised, which I, I hope we're going to be able to touch on. But Natalie, before we get on to that and back to that. I think um, the piece we're making right now, cinema, absolutely could be made in Tehran. Could be. Absolutely. I think the journey that I've had as an artist in the UK, perhaps the, the way I've been able to make work, the way that text, language, or imagery has been experimented with, has been different here. But as a, there are a broad and brilliant um, network of theatre makers in Tehran who are making work that is political, not political, feminist, not feminist, uh, experimenting with form. They are, I think of the Fadge Festival, audiences are packed out. I would kill for that number of audiences on tour and I will continue to and maybe we need to get together. Um, there's something about, about that, about, well, I guess when we started making cinema, there were questions about, um, yes, it's a, it's a piece that looks at uh, a 
a point in time, it's, it was um, 1978, I'll be very quick, 1978, uh, a film is being screened, the cinema is packed out with families, and a fire is set from the inside. Uh, people try to escape to discover the doors are locked from the outside. So to give you a bit more context, um, it was in the years leading up to the uh, to the revolution that then became known as the Islamic Revolution of 79. What I'm, where I'm driving with this is that it is a piece that we start to think about and go, well, should it be, should we represent the audience members? Should we involve um, the projectionist? Is that how we tell the story? And at the end of the day, we went, actually, this is about sharing a hidden history through, uh, through a theatrical lens, through magic realism, and we settled on, and we tested this out here, actually, um, with the character being a cat. Because quite often when you think of Iran, you think, mmm, Persian cat, mmm, rugs, mmm, saffron, mmm, <laughs> orientalism, mmm, yes, beautiful, and then somebody goes, yeah, but don't they have other things? But so do we. Let's be fair, but so do we. Um, so, could I make cinema in Tehran? Yes, absolutely. Could I have perhaps made the kinds of experiments, worked with the kinds of collaborators? Um, I may have had to make different choices, but I think that I don't ever want to romanticize censorship as a form of developing work, as a, as a way to inspire invention. But we can't deny that when we look at Eastern European theatre or we look at work coming out of this island now, some of the more politicised edges of social change are prompting artists to work differently. But at the end of the day, an artist is a product of its social context. How can we not be? I'm not sure if I answered Stella's question. <laughs> But explored some interesting areas. Now, I think you know, we, this, this is an open conversation. Um, we, you know, we, we enjoyed beginning our conversation an hour before we, we got here, and we will continue afterwards, no doubt. But here's an opportunity for you to come in, but particularly uh, with anything that you've been burning to ask uh, during uh, the, the, the first part of this discussion. And to say a little bit about who you are as well, um, uh, uh, when you are. So we've got a so we've got a context for that. Okay, so my name is Rachel. I work at the Fancy Arts Centre. I support the Caroline and producing the Double Key Market and other festivals over the UK. Um, so I've been with Mia at the Key Festivals and we've had a few of these discussions in quite a lot. Um, the idea of uh, truths are quite a lot and talking about the uh, very true that people um, I was wondering about kind of the autobiographical nature of work like this and whether you find people are very keen to know is it true? Is it you? Is it your story? And that's something that people almost want you to say yes to, that they want it to be you. And I always feel like the, the, the amazing thing about theatre is that it doesn't have to be you. Know, I just wonder if the responsibility is this, but I want to know if it's true. That's very interesting to ask. I'm going to put it to both if they both wish to answer. And just going back to the Greeks again, theatre, a word that means a place where social truths emerge. So is it about truth or is it about storytelling, which is what we've, we've been hearing, uh, and, and who we're telling those stories to? Oh, both. Uh, both storytelling and truth. Um, or oh, is it truth as I'm storytelling it? It is the truth in the room, in this theatrical universe that we created. And Rosie, to answer your question, I feel like sometimes people actually, to, I, surprisingly, not that many people ask me, are you a child killer? <laughs> I would have thought that more people would ask me that question, but no, not that many people ask. Um, the last time I was asked that was, and it was literally one of the only times, people sometimes ask, so very gently, because I guess it's um, sensitive, um, it was by, if you remember when we were in Gloucester, there was a Palestinian, this fascinating couple, she's uh, Palestinian, she, she, she calls herself Palestinian, I would say 
in Israel we call people in her status Arab Israeli. She defines herself as Palestinian, but then I discovered she lives in a with not in the occupied territory. She lives what is defined as Israel, um, and she's married to a British Jew, and the 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 children are Jewslamim. She said, <laughs> I found very funny. She was a beautiful woman, like. Um, Beautiful soul, like she, she was cooking uh, Palestinian food after the performance in Gloucester. Um, and she <coughs> asked me immediately, she asked me immediately, is it your story? Did you, did you do this when you were in your military service? Um, yeah. Because of course you would have undertaken military service. Well, my military, so now we'll reveal okay. the truth, okay. <laughs> the actual reality. Now, I, I took, my military service was very particular. I was teaching uh, theater in the Pride area. Yeah. For, poor teenagers, basically, or immigrants from Ethiopia, a lot Jews that was immigrating yeah. from Ethiopia to Israel. Yeah. I think Nia's point about how um, that, that member of the audience defined herself is, is interesting, because I'm going back to early social movements of theatre that I was active in. You know, uh, do define yourself as black, do define yourself as British, do define yourself as disabled, do you define yourself as lesbian, gay, uh, transgender, um, did we say queer then? Yes, we said queer. Because we've gone through a number of social movements and, and self-definition is really important. I spent five years running a festival in Belfast and you can imagine uh, with two conflicting communities there, a number of issues around what kind of theatre was made came out. One year, having been to Tel Aviv, having invited a dance troupe from uh, Tel Aviv to visit my festival, I discovered that the Catholic and Protestant communities defined themselves very strongly uh, in relation to those two communities, the Palestinian and Israeli communities, that they felt an affinity and defined themselves in those ways. And I found myself on radio defending my choice of uh, dance troupe, uh, being told by a member of the Catholic uh, community with whom I'd worked very closely, um, you are disrespecting the Catholic community in Belfast. Who could have imagined that? It's a fascinating thing around definition and self-definition. Whose, whose story are you telling? Are you telling your own truth? Are you telling what you perceive to be somebody else's truth? Are you taking on a, uh, the mantle in order to tell a story? And theatre can do all of these things. It's very, very nuanced. And just having the one short conversation doesn't necessarily tell that whole story, does it? Nasli, you were going to come in. I think this idea of... Um is it autobiographical? I think this is really fascinating because there seems to be a movement of solo pieces out there over the last perhaps four to five years where artists have said, actually, I am gonna, I am gonna tell a very personal story. Um, and actually by doing that, I'm gonna come from this foundation of definitions and I'm gonna try and bring it back to a human level. I think that is a form of theatre in its own right. And I think that absolutely we've seen a lot of this kind of work. And whether it's Genesis has come from new writing, it's been commissioned, the artist's been asked to make this work, um, looking, uh, prompting them to look within themselves as the landscape. But I also think that um, you can cross a border and make a piece of work from other biographical stories and that also has a validity I think it's a question of absolutely what is the quality of the truth what is the what is the dynamic of it where is this notion of genuine or where is the that point of truth looking to be ignited is the truth that you want to make the work for 20 people and it's that exchange that potency that intimacy that you want? Is it that proximity that enables the truth to happen? Or is it that you're making work that is on for audiences of a thousand at a time and you're wanting a bigger truth to happen? You're wanting to, um, I guess, to incite, to uh, provoke, to uh, give a gift of change. So I think that inevitably, there are elements of autobiographical ingredients in there. I think we would both agree that we have, um, we have a start point that is very honest, 
and there is a, an emotional charge that is personal. But whether tomorrow, if uh, you and I were going to go and direct a mammoth or we wanted to do a pinter, we would be doing that because we, we are choosing that piece as the vehicle to tell a truth. That truth tells it best that way. So I think, it is, I think it's about asking the artist, what is the truth? What is the best vehicle for your truth? Is it autobiographical? Or is it about picking up an existing work and playing it straight? Um, yeah. And interestingly, both artists have said that their work changes, evolves, according to the subject matter or the material um, that uh, they're, they're addressing. And just, just going back to what I was saying about sort of theatrical movements, this weekend we're celebrating uh, Joan Whit Littlewood and her uh, theatre workshop and her her shaking up of the theatrical establishment in, in, in the UK. And we've got an anniversary. How many years ago was Joan uh, radicalising theatre? We've got, we've got a big anniversary this year. And since Joan Littlewood uh, started making theatre, with the aim of reaching out widely, what was she doing? She was taking uh, lorries around the country and, and, and opening up uh, the back and making a stage. And Oh, What a Lovely War was, was originally performed not in a theatre, but off the back of a lorry. And after her, you know, waves and waves of theatre, and you, you, think, you, you think of the theatre establishment now, the David Hares and, and the Howard Brentons, who, who started out agitprop and agitpropping in the streets. But those, those, those very crude uh, theatrical uh, inventions of the time were right then, that form was right then. Now it does appear to be a, to be a sledgehammer approach and we're more nuanced in, in, in the kind of theatre that we're making. It's often been said that, uh, that when, we're, when, we're in, um, when we're in the good times, which is uh, not the recessionary times, uh, uh, theatre goes to sleep. Uh, challenging theatre is not made. That you know, when we're when we're not when we're not in a, a period of uh, of conflict around uh, the politics in the, in the country, that 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 uh, uh, exciting theatre uh, theatre it does not move on. Does anybody feel that to be the case, or I want to challenge that that perspective? Because it's not just in places of conflict where conflict emerges. I mean, we've seen we've seen we've we've seen plenty of conflict on our streets that it, that, uh, that that is not around uh, you know, uh, uh, people taking up arms against each other, but just having very strongly opposing views. Um, Except the easy sell, aren't they? The things that are in the world are not challenged to bring to in the public, whereas I think at an individual level, people are always going to be coming up with their own ideas and conflicts must persist, regardless of uh, you know, whether it's world level conflict. There's loads of great art, there's loads of kind of challenge happening between the two world wars, and you know, the kind of periods of self reflection. And, Changes to class systems, changes to finance, so it's never just a major conflict, is it? It's major, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, the other thing I did want to say about um, the kind of truth, uh, you referred a lot to truth, and I kind of, I think maybe theatre could have more impact at times of those of like, you know, challenging events, but in terms of the actual truth of it, yeah. it, has, you know, it continues regardless of whether there's major conflict or not, the, the truth I got from your piece was that this was that sense of conflictedness that ran throughout it, you know, there's you as a drag artist, there's five like really strong women in uniform, <laughs> and then there's all this kind of homely life, and it felt sort of hyper real to me, it felt like what it might be like to be my life, my family here, but growing up, but that's not to do with, I kind of lost track of the importance of when they're political idiot got assassinated because I'm not really, sounds awful to say, I'm not that interested in what's happening at a distance, but that made it resonate to me, so, so what it might be like to grow up with. You were in that whole sense of conflict, and I think those things, those kind of minor conflicts are always there, aren't they? Regardless of the techniques or the nation. So, this, the, so this, this work made you imagine yourself into that place? 
or, or, or you saw connections between your life and, and the lives you saw on stage? I think it's connections in perhaps a degree of empathy on what it might be like to present with those challenges, whether the actual rights and wrongs of the action and who, who was right and wrong within the performance seems academic slightly to me. It's more the sense of getting an appreciation of what it might be like to. This is our task though. I think I think you've both really opened up a, a fascinating layer. What is the purpose of, the, of art? And it is to make us feel. We have the business case for it. We have the diversity case. We've talked about the moral case. But at the end of the day, <coughs> it is about exactly this. And I think as artists that when we are um, truly at our most vibrant, we are meeting that moment of feeling and that is the thing that's what we need because for our art to exist we need that completion point with with human beings and empathy yeah absolutely it, it's core to making that happen if if i or if uh, we can't find that point of, of being able to open up and I'm, I'm not talking about catharsis here necessarily that i think that's an artistic choice but it is about that moment of going, how did you feel? Did you feel? In this moment, I was able to create a space with you where we forgot in order to remember to feel, that we have perhaps had an exchange that has made you, perhaps tomorrow, talk to your friend and go, you know that thing that's happening just down the road? It's just like that thing that I saw last night. What, what might we do? How might we talk about it? How might we be the generation that shift it just a little bit? How do we do that? But I think there is something interesting that you were saying about programming choice at times of um, where there is very little money going around, that uh, perhaps pieces like mine and pieces like yours start to find the challenge of being programmed. I think the, cha the, the uh, challenge has perhaps been misarticulated because the stories that we are looking at and that we are giving a light to begin to answer the questions of what, what is Britain doing in the Middle East? Well, yeah, actually someone just, who told me that? Someone just told me that ah, in Italian, we were performing in Edge Hill University and there was an Italian man, what is his name? He works with Dario Fo. He is the translator of Dario Fo for Italian to English. And he is now also here, Dario Fo gave him the right to perform his plays. And he is now in the UK, and he was in Edge Hill, uh, sleeping there and all that. And he, he, he was so excited about the piece. And he told me that um, about the British, that how he feels that like I'm letting them off, them off too easily. And it's their responsibility. You're letting, you're letting us off too easily. The piece. The yeah. ballad of the Burning Star is letting the British off too easily, and they you should like let them have it because it's their responsibility, and they don't like to see it. So in terms of what you're speaking, in a sense, for me, I feel like I could challenge myself more as an artist, and because uh, I'm because I'm performing a piece about a conflict that is far away, like so taking this to Israel would definitely, for me, would put me in a greater risk, actual physical risk potentially. Or even like a few discussions people said, like take it to New York, good luck with that. <laughs> um, you know, um, so here in a, some ways it's actually, because as you said, this island is so open, uh, think relatively, yes. and people are so used. Um, and, and then, so yeah, so it would be interesting if to make a piece that is as contentious, but in the British context, we could be... But making these pieces that we make are about a conversation with Britain. And I think this is... Yeah. And I think that you can't escape the parallels. You can't escape the symbols. There are things about... Um, in our last piece, there were, it was set in the 50s, and 
a lot of it happened in Tehran, but quite a bit of it happened in, in Durham, strangely. I'll come to that another time. But people were saying fascinating things of, yeah, that was my mum. My mum was the same. She got married really quickly and actually, do you know what, she had to hold on to her virginity. And these are people who have lived in Britain for a number of generations telling us this. So there are, there are similarities, but where is it that, where is the space within our work to be able to um, not only hold the mirror, but also acknowledge that actually enough with guilt, enough with that. Enough with your observer, guardian, reading, I buy those papers and I love them. <laughs> but enough with that. That's not about negating responsibility to feel, but rather, what can we do now? What is it we're going to do now? Because if we looked at one another's landscapes, artistic landscapes, the responsibility internationally to be able to have vigorous conversations is with every artist. So. I think there is, we do choose to make work in the UK for a reason, there are, there's a, a level of freedom of speech, there's a level of freedom of artistic choice. Funding. There, absolutely. And this is really interesting, absolutely. Yeah. It is, there is a direct line from government where artists can access monies to make work. And yes, there are some questions that are put to us about what we might make on whom we might make it with. But at the end of the day, even with that money, I think as an artist, you, you make a choice. You go, actually, how am I going to make this work financially or what have you? Because I want to pay my artists. The source of that money, let's talk about that. Am I, am I at peace with that? Actually, Zenda are, but we don't take it lightly. Because when we arrive internationally and we say we're a UK company, sometimes that's really comfortable and it opens doors. And sometimes that slams them right in our face. Thank you. Um, I'm very aware that we've reached the actual timed end of our session. However, we did start a little bit late, so can I just beg your indulgence for another four and three quarter minutes so that we can, we can wrap up? Um, the as long as I make them the, free. <laughs> so, so I'm, I'm, and I'm being precise there. Um, there's a whole world of discussion we, we haven't engaged on here. Theatre is such a marvellous and flexible tool. We haven't talked at all about, um, about theatre as a tool for healing. We've talked about theatre as a tool for storytelling. The whole movement, theatre in place of war. What a great name. Theatre in places of war. Theatre artists working in places of war to bring... Uh, communities together, but theatre in place of war, theatre instead of war, isn't that a great possible use of language? Theatre, make love not war, no, make theatre not war, <laughs> yeah. could, 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 be, could be our, our, our slogan together. Um, I think we, you know, we, we have had a, a, a great conversation here this morning, but there, there may be a voice that hasn't been heard yet that's still uh, burning to, like those burning stars. So is there anything else that anybody would like to add before I thank and round up? I'd just like to say that I've seen many pieces and for me I felt I walked away changed. So thank you for your work. Which I think is, you know, Thank you. Well, thank you, Caroline, for enabling us to come together, uh, Chabawaki Market, in this discussion on this historic weekend. Uh, thank you, uh, Nia. May you go on ad infinitum <laughs> <laughs> with, with your work. And, and Natalie, may you continue to be Zender, may you continue to be live, and as, <laughs> as live as you have been this morning uh, into the future. And go out and see more theatre uh, and take more theatre to more audiences. Thank you.